Hey guys, welcome to Mr. Valentin's YouTube video on Beowulf and defining the epic. Uh, one of the earliest forms of literature is the epic. Uh, an epic is a long narrative poem that recounts the adventures of a legendary hero in pursuit of a goal of national importance. The epic becomes the focus for the rest of Beowulf. Alright, so, again, alright, it is a long narrative poem. This is essential. Long narrative poem. And it recounts the adventure of a legendary hero. And of course, our legendary hero for Beowulf is Beowulf. This is the most important literary term that you understand for Beowulf. The epic is composed of four parts. All right. The first part is that there is an epic hero, all right? the legendary hero. And the epic hero is the central character of an epic, all right? a larger-than-life figure, figure typical of noble or semi-divine birth. In this case, he's of noble birth. Uh, his uncle is Haglak the king. We find out that the epic hero will go on a quest, the adventure, a quest is a long, dangerous journey or mission undertaken by the epic hero. It's the opportunity for the hero to show his heroism. The next part is that he performs valorous deeds. Right? Valor is our root word. Valor generally means good. Uh, shows words, shows deeds that are going to show his courage, his strength, and his virtue. Again, courage, strength, and virtue. The last part of the epic is the fact that there is divine intervention. Right. And divine intervention is when the hero receives help from a god or another supernatural force who takes an interest in his quest. Right. The epic is around and been around for a very long time, but it also makes its appearance in popular culture. A great example of the epic would be The Hunger Games, where we have an epic hero this kind of legendary or larger-than-life figure in Katniss, and she goes on this quest to save her sister, or to really save herself. Um, and what she's doing is for the good of her district. And we see divine intervention during the Hunger Games when medicine and food is being dropped from the sky. Uh, another great example is Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Uh, and again, we see the same thing. We have Scott Pilgrim, and he goes on this quest to defeat the seven evil ex-girlfriends, uh, ex-boyfriends, um, and he performs good deeds throughout, uh, and we see divine intervention when he dies and he's brought back to life. Alright, literary terms still at play. We have alliteration, repetition of initial consonant sounds. Alright. Crazy, killer clowns, can't find carbon monoxide, who knows. All right, but a repetition of initial consonant sounds. Assonance, all right, repetition of vowel sounds, generally in unrhymed words.
something like maybe we'll go with ignite the fire right, we hear that strong I sound fire night right, Kennings two word poetic renaming of someone or something personification giving lifelike qualities to non-living or non-human things. Comparison that uses like or as is a simile, and the metaphor, a comparison that does not use like or as. So some background information on Beowulf. Uh, again, we have no known author. Indicate that. All right, And the poem wasn't written down till approximately the 11th century. There's some contention about that. Some people say 10th century. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't really concern us too much, but it's something to think about. Uh, at the dawn of the English literature stands Beowulf. Like the epics of other cultures, Beowulf is the self-portrait of the culture. It's the adventure-packed poem of the Anglo-Saxon of the 8th century. Um, and it embodies the British tradition uh, when we put our focus into this legendary figure, there is a strong influence between Christianity and paganistic themes, something the movie actually emphasizes quite well, I must say. All right. So we get the Christian and the pagan influences. We came off of the three poems, all right, which really emphasize the pagan ideals with multiple gods. And here in Beowulf, we see the Christian ideas here. Um, and we see these two ideas, they kind of mix. Right? There's a mixture. Uh, at certain times, they'll be praying to one god, and then shortly thereafter, they'll be praying to multiple gods. And that's something to keep in mind, that we have both this Christian and pagan influence. Uh, it is a life ruled largely by fate, uh, which correlates to the pagan idea, because as Christians... Christians believe, of course, in free will. Again, we see the Mead Hall, a place that emphasizes alcohol and entertainment above all else. New literary terms that you should be familiar with is the allusion, a reference to a literary or historical person, place, or thing, and, of course, we see foreshadowing a subtle hint at future events throughout the story. So those are our two very basic literary terms. If you have your textbook available, uh, we're going to begin on page 41, and we'll progress and throughout, and I'll keep you informed as to what pages we're on and things that I'm looking at. At the beginning of the book, we're introduced to... Grendel, our evil monster. Evil monster. Right there. Um, we've seen different artistic interpretations. The one in the book on page 40 indicates him as like this giant hairy monster. The one in the movie has him more as like a balding, schmeagle type character. Uh, I like this one particularly, kind of this lumbering evil monster. Slightly hairy, slightly frightening, little devil horns. I think this interpretation works quite well. Um, so, we're introduced to this Grendel character. Uh, as they describe him, he's a powerful monster, living down in the darkness, he growls in pain. And so the question is, why is he growling in pain? And of course, we find out that there's loud music in the Mead Hall. Alright, so, music in the Mead Hall. What's my little music notes? Music in the Mead Hall, alright, bothers him. He has sensitive ears. And so my question is, should we pity Grendel? It's not his fault that these Danish fellows are playing loud music. Um, something to just think about. Um, I feel like Grendel kind of kind of gets a bum rap with that. Right? Bothers him. They do describe him as demon-like. They say at the bottom of 41, till the monster stirred, that demon, that fiend, 
Grendel, who haunted the moors, the wild marshes, and made his home in a hell. Not hell, but earth. So we kind of get this descriptor that this demon is from hell. And so that despite this idea that I'm saying of pity, we shouldn't bother. He is a hell spawn. We see, actually, an illusion very early on when they continue to describe him. This is 41 going into 42. He was spawned in that slime conceived by a pair of those monsters, born of Cain, murderous creatures banished by God, punished forever for the crime of Abel's death. All right, so we see an allusion to Cain. And again, who is Cain? Cain is the oldest son of Adam and Eve who murdered his brother Abel. So that becomes important. So he's described as a violent creature through this illusion of Cain. Continuing on, um, as night comes, what does Grendel do? Well, they say, and this is on page 42, line 30. Then when darkness had dropped, Grendel went up to Herod, wondering what the warriors would do in that hall when their drinking was done. He found them sprawled in sleep, suspecting nothing, their dreams undisturbed. The monster's thoughts were as quick as his greed or his claws. He slipped through the door, and there in the silence, he snatched up thirty men. He smashed them unknowing in their beds and ran out with their bodies, the blood dripping behind him, back to his lair, delighted with his night slaughter. All right, so it's important to note how destructive he is, all right? He manages to slaughter 30 people. And it doesn't seem to require much effort. All right, he's extraordinarily violent. All right, but we find out that Grendel isn't protected from everything. Grendel cannot touch the throne, and this is where we see divine intervention at play. All right, the throne uh, is protected by God, and this is found on page 443. The second paragraph, right there where it says, So mankind's enemy. So mankind's enemy continued his crimes, killing as often as he could, coming alone, bloodthirsty and horrible. Though he lived in Herod, when the night hid him, he never dared to touch King Hrothgar's glorious throne, protected by God. God, whose love Grendel could not know. All right, so Grendel cannot know God's love. God's love is intangible to him. And so we find out that no one goes anywhere near the Mead Hall for over 12 years. And so it's abandoned, so to say. All right. Important characters. Hrothgar, he's our king. He's the king of the Danes. Herod is the meat hall. And Hilfdane is Hrothgar's father. So we're introduced to the coming of Beowulf. Uh, we find out a little bit about Beowulf as this extraordinary hero, the nephew of the king of the Geats. The king of the Geats is his uncle, Higlak. And Edge, though, is Beowulf's father. So a couple questions. Who does Beowulf bring with him? 
Well, this is found on page 44. And it starts off with the paragraph, In his far-off home, Higlak's followers and the strongest of the Geats, all right, and so they're describing Beowulf here, he's greater and stronger than anyone anywhere in this world. Heard how Grendel filled night with horror. Jumping down a little bit. So Beowulf chose the mightiest men he could find, the bravest and best of Geats, 14 in all. All right, so he brings 14 people with him. All right, and their journey, which you expect to be kind of this epic, over-the-top adventure, is easy. This is not a difficult journey. As he arrives on shore, they're introduced to this Danish warrior. Now, the Danish warrior approaches them. And so my question to you is, how does he approach them? Let's take a look at the very specific passage um, and see what the watcher is concerned with. Whose soldiers are you, he says at the top of 45, you who've carried in your deep-keeled ship across the sea road to this country of mine? Listen. I've stood on these cliffs longer than you know, keeping our coast free of pirates, raiders, sneaking ashore from their ships, seeking our lives and our gold. None have ever come more openly, and yet you've offered no password, no sign from my prince, no permission from my people for your landing here. Nor have I ever seen, out of all the men on earth, one greater than has come with you. So again, what is the Danish warrior concerned about? Or Danish watcher. Pardon me. And of course, the Danish watcher is concerned that they're pirates, that they're there to pillage and destroy what they have. All right. Beowulf responds to him, explaining exactly who he is, who his father is, Edgethel, All right, and says, I've done this before. I've killed monsters. All right. I'm a great, strong, wonderful person. We also find out that he's going to fight Grendel in a unique way. So if you turn your text to page 47, he says, and this is a little ways down, uh, say around line, we'll start at 260, that I alone, and with the help of my men, and this is Beowulf speaking, may purge all evil from this hall. I have heard, too, that the monster's scorn of men is so great that he needs no weapons and fears none. Nor will I. My, horde, my lord Higlak might think less of me if I let my sword go where my feet were afraid to. If I hid behind some broad linden shield, my hands alone shall fight for the struggle for life against the monster. So we find out he's going to fight, all right, with his bare hands, which is a bold move. So why is he going to fight this way? What would be the reasoning behind this? If you turn to page 48, we get the answer. No, I expect no Danes will fret about the sewing our shroud if he wins. And if death does take me, send the hammered, hammered mail of my armor to Higlak. Return the inheritance I had from Hrethel and he from Wayland. Fate will unwind as it must. So we find out Beowulf is leaving everything up to fate. So there we have the pagan ideologies. So Beowulf will obviously fight Grendel. Uh, and so Grendel stirs the second that Beowulf enters the picture. Uh, and he goes on another destructive path. All right. But there's an interesting part here around line 309. It says, But fate that night intended Grendel to gnaw the broken bones of his last human suffer. supper. So here we have Grendel's certain doom. What might cause Grendel's certain doom, or what literary term is at work here? And of course, the literary term we see is foreshadowing.
And so, when Grendel sees the first Geet, what happens? Well, let's read. This is around line 312. Human eyes were watching his evil steps, waiting to see his swift hard claws. Grendel snatched at the first geet he came to. He ripped him apart. He cut his body to bits with powerful jaws, drank the blood from his veins, and bolted him down, hands and feet. Death and Grendel's great teeth come together. All right, so immediately there's destruction throughout the hole, and Grendel just manages to slaughter this geet. But when he meets Beowulf, Beowulf challenges him as if it's no big deal. Notice, and this is a little further down, around line 320, how Beowulf is treated when when Beowulf stir when Grendel stirs at him. Then he stepped to another still body, clutched at Beowulf with his claws. He grasped at a strong-hearted, wakeful sleeper, and was instantly seized himself. Claws bent back as Beowulf leaned up on one arm. All right, so Beowulf manages to oh, hold good ground against Grendel, and so much so. Uh, and then, as indicated in our delightfully graphic picture over here, they wrestle, and they fight, and there's more destruction of the hall, and things are shattering and falling apart. And Beowulf gets into a bit position where he manages to rip his shoulder off. If you take a look around page 50, line 385, Grendel saw the last, that his strength was deserting him. His claws bound fast, Higlak's brave follower tearing at his hand. The monster's hatred rose higher, but his power had gone. He twisted in pain, and the blitting sinews deep in his soldier snapped. Muscle and bones split and broke. So, Beowulf really manages to do big damage to his arm. He rips it off, and what does he do with it? Well, skipping all the way down to the bottom. The victory for the proof. Hanging high from the rafters where Beowulf had hung it was the monster's arm, claw, and soldier, shoulder, and all. So, victory comes because Beowulf rips his arm off and hangs it high upon the rafters. And presumably, Grendel goes back to his underwater lair and dies. Before we progress on, I thought it might be a good time for some literary term review. So, let's see. You have your literary terms, hopefully, in an easy-to-find spot. If not, go on to the website, dvalentin.pbworks.com. You go there. You click English 10. And take a look at September 20th, Anglo-Saxon literary terms. That'll help you. Right, that will give you the list of literary terms you need. So hopefully you have that. Maybe you have it pulled up on the computer simultaneously as this. So let's see what literary terms we come up with. He was spawned in that slime, that monster born of Cain. Right, this one should be easy because we did this one earlier. That monster born of Cain. So Cain is our big clue. And so, of course, we know the answer is foreshadowing. Next part. So mankind's enemy continued his crime. The part we want to look at, of course, here is mankind's enemy. And here it's two words meaning Grendel. So if we have a two-word poetic renaming of someone or something, what do we have? And of course the answer is Kennings. Wondering what the warriors would do. All right, there you should notice right away there's a sound that's being produced. Wondering what the warriors would do. 
And there, we have pers uh, whew, that is not correct. We have alliteration. So sorry. The repetition of initial consonant sounds. The next part, hate had triumphed. Hate had triumphed. My question to you is, can hate really triumph? No. So here we have personification. The ship foamed through the sea like a bird. Now here you might be inclined to choose two literary terms, but really, all right, we want to choose the best one. Through the sea like a bird. All right. So we have the word like, which should immediately clue us in that we have a simile. But fate that night intended Grendel to gnaw the broken bones of his last human supper. Again, we've seen this one before in this very short review. And here we have foreshadowing. Here's our last one. That shepherd of evil, guardian of crime. Who are they talking about? They're talking about Grendel. Are they two words? Just about. All right, we don't count words of or the. All right, so, shepherd of evil, guardian of crime. All right, this is two examples of Kennings. The final two bits, all right, begin with the monster's lair. We find out, and this is on the top of 51. All right, the Danes celebrate Beowulf's victory, but that night, though, Grendel's mother kills Hrothgar's closest friend and carries off her child's claw. The next day, the horrified king tells Beowulf about the two monsters and their underwater lair. All right, so we're introduced to a new character. Of course, this character is Grendel's mother. All right, and she's angrier, bigger, and scarier. All right, and Beowulf, of course, agrees to fight. There's no issues there. He goes seeing the, he calls her the She-Wolf, another example of Kennings. And as they fight, all right, they fight underwater. We find out that they fight for hours underwater. How can Beowulf fight under? water for hours? Well, he's the epic hero. Of course he can do that. That is no big deal for him. All right, he's legendary. He's larger than life. All right, so this fighting under the water for hours, we might want to describe that one literary term as the legendary hero. As they fight, neither one seems to be doing too much. She's clawing at him and his mail, which are interwoven rings, protect him. But he doesn't seem to be doing well. His weapon, Prunting, is the name of his sword, doesn't really defend him in any way. But of course, magically, because this is an epic story, something strange happens. If you look at the top of 54, then he saw, hanging on the wall, a heavy sword, hammered by giants, strong and blessed with their magic, the best of all weapons, but so massive that no ordinary man could lift its carved and decorated length. So, on the wall, there just happens to be a sword. Where did this sword come from? We don't know. All right. The best answer? Divine Intervention. All right, God has investment in Beowulf. All right, and of course he slays Grendel's mother. He chops off her head, and then he goes and chops off Grendel's head and presents it as a trophy. 
And then our story skips till 50 years later, and this is on page 56. After being honored by Hrothgar, Beowulf and his fellow Geats return home, where he eventually becomes king. All right, so 50 years later, Beowulf is king. And we find out there's a dragon menacing the kingdom. All right, he's an old man now, and he's determined to beat him. Shockingly, this last part doesn't go the way that your traditional narrative goes. You expect Beowulf to, to really take charge, and that's not what happens in this final bit. All right, Beowulf says, and this is on page 56, I've never known fear. As a youth, I, thought in, I fought in endless battles. I'm old now, but I will fight again, seek fame still, if the dragon hiding in his tower dares to face me. All right. Beowulf's fighting for different reasons this time. He fights for fame. This doesn't go well for Beowulf. He's doing it for the wrong reasons. He's no longer really performing valorous deeds. And so Beowulf fights the dragon. And how does that go? The answer, not well. He gets injured, and he's on the cusp of death. And so we're introduced to a new character, whose name is Wiglaf. All right. Wiglaf is a good soldier. His family turns out to be Swedish, uh, and he's super powerful, just as powerful as Beowulf. We found out he has a father, whose name is Wexton. Right, we get that in that long descriptor on page 58. And Wexton comes and saves Beowulf. Doot. Saves him. All right. But in the end, it's a little too little too late. And unfortunately, Beowulf dies. All right. Gold triumphs, as I like to say it. All right. Um, so, Beowulf, Wexton return. Beowulf dies. All right. They return with treasures and riches. Uh, we also find out that several warriors have left Beowulf in the heat of battle, and for this, Wiglaf punishes them. Uh, and the last dying wish Beowulf has is, is a tower to be built in his honor. And in the farewell, it states, this is on page 61, then the Geats built the tower as Beowulf had asked, strong and tall, so soldiers could find it from far and wide working for ten long days that made his mo they made his monument, sealed his ashes and walls as straight and high as wise and willing hands could raise them. So, Beowulf is still helping people in the afterlife, so it's kind of a nice little resolution we have here. So, Thursday's your exam. I think you'll be okay. All right, especially if you listen to this entire lengthy podcast. Um... Matching column, multiple choice, uh, and you should be okay if you study. And since you're listening to my podcast, I have the utmost faith in you. So good luck. Tuesday after school, extra help. Thursday exam.